Welcome to Canadian Coffee House Crime. My name is Catherine, and today's case takes us to Toronto, Ontario. Toronto is on the east side of Canada with 46 kilometers of its waterfront on the northeast side of Lake Ontario. It holds 2.8 million people and is the financial capital of Canada with a high concentration of banks in the financial district. Toronto, which name derives from Iroquois origins, is also a popular area for the film and television industry. and is home to the first permanent IMAX movie theater. Toronto houses an abundance of sports entertainment, which includes the NHL Toronto Maple Leafs, basketball's NBA Toronto Raptors, Toronto Blue Jays for the NBA. And CFL's Toronto Organauts. On December 31, 1985, Durham Region Police were called to the area of Sunderland, which is 100 kilometers northeast of Toronto. A man named Fred Patterson with his two daughters were looking for his dog along his large wooded property when he saw a pile of garbage. When he went over to the pile of garbage, he was astonished to see it was actually not garbage, it was a badly decomposed body. At the scene was a deceased body of a nine-year-old girl. There were multiple stab wounds to the body in the area of her chest, deep enough to penetrate the vertebrae, and that was actually the official cause of death. She was wearing a beige turtleneck sweater, a blue pullover, and a blouse with buttons missing. Next to her right foot was her underwear, and in the tall grass lay a child's wind instrument called a recorder with a name on it. The name was Christine Jessup. Christine Marion Jessup was born November 29th, 1974 in Queensville, Ontario, 62 kilometers away from Toronto. Queensville has a population of around 700 people in the area. It has a store, a cemetery, a church, a community center, a handful of houses and the playground. John Candy once owned a house one kilometer south of Queensville. Christine's mother's name is Janet and her father's name is Bob and her brother is five years older and his name is Kenny. Her father worked as a lead installer. He was a lead installer for a company that installed wire for telephone communication for businesses in the surrounding area. Bob had made friends with Mr. and Mrs. Calvin and Heather Hoover. Calvin was one of the installers at Eastern Independent Telecom and Heather was a dispatcher and they lived about 50 kilometers away from Bob and Janet and they had four boys. They would get together on days off once in a while and they would have barbecues, play dates, tea parties, babysitting. 
Christine called Heather Auntie Heather and Janet called Heather Goofy Noofy and they were very close. On October 1st, 1985, Janet was over at Heather's house for a tea. At the time, Bob was at the Toronto East Detention Centre for 18 months for frauding family members and Janet was over at Heather's discussing a trip that she and Kenny were going to be taking on October 3rd to go see Bob at the detention centre. She had mentioned that she might have to leave Christine alone for a spell of maybe half an hour between when she got off school and when Janet and Kenny came home from the detention center. Christine got off the bus at 10 to 4 and Janet was saying that she would hope that she would be getting home from the detention center by quarter after 4 and hope that she'd be okay. On October 3rd, 1985, Christine made plans that day to meet her friend Leslie at the park at four o'clock as her mother and brother would not be home from the detention center yet. Christine got off the school bus and was going to stop at her house to grab some change to buy some gum at the store before she went to the playground across the street from the store to meet Leslie. Janet and Kenny came home at 410. Janet started looking for Christine at five o'clock and there's not a lot of place to go. Pretty much the store, the playground, and the cemetery. Christine liked to play in the cemetery that was behind her house. They noticed that her bike was lying in the shed area on its side and her jacket was hanging up on a hook when they came home and Janet thought it was strange that it was on a hook that was taller for Christine. She also observed that the newspaper that was in a plastic bag and the mail was brought in. Christine was sweet, sensitive, and feisty. She was independent. She loved baseball and her big brother. She loved her dolls and all her animals. She had pet frogs, baby chicks, but she especially loved her little beagle named Freckles. Plus, she was absolutely adorable. She wouldn't have run away. Janet was sure there was an explanation. At sunset, Janet called the York Region Police. The York Regional Police treated the incident as an abduction, but the problem was that they never handled an abduction before. The scene was compromised from the start because the police were coming in and out everywhere, Neighbors and friends were coming in and out and touching everything. The newspaper that had been brought in was in a plastic bag, but the bag was thrown out before fingerprints could be tested. Uh, they did their best for a small town police force, but that's their statement and they're sticking to it. They set up a command post at the fire hall and soon they were able to rally volunteers and conducted searches. Bob was released from the Toronto Detention Centre based on humanitarian grounds and they pleaded to the public using the media. The police came to the conclusion that abductions usually aren't random and that someone usually knows the victim. The Jessops were requested to provide a list of all neighbours, friends, families and town people who were allowed within the house unsupervised. This list, of course, included Calvin and Heather Hoover. When the search for Christine was going on, Heather came down to see Janet, and the police sergeant Raymond Bunce questioned her about her and her husband's whereabouts during the time of the abduction. She said she was at work and that Calvin was home with the boys. Their alibis were never looked into, and Calvin was never questioned by the police. Christine went missing October 3rd, 1984. On November 29th, she was supposed to turn 10 years old, but she was not home for her birthday. On December 25th, she was supposed to have Christmas with her family, but she was not there. Christmas came without a tree, little celebration, and barely any gifts for little Kenny. Then December 31st, Fred Patterson made his discovery in Sunderland while looking for his dog and found Christine 90 days after she went missing, 
56 kilometers east of her home in Sunderland. Sunderland was not in the York Regional District. It was in the Durham Regional District. So the case was turned over to the Durham Police. The York Regional Police turned in all the notes, but Durham did not use them because they said their notes were too amateurish. Inspector Robert Brown took over the case and because Christine had been missing for 90 days and was heavily covered in the media, he, f he found a tense amount of public pressure to find the perpetrator of the crime. One thing he questioned was why Christine's remains were 56 kilometers away from Queensville. He instructed two detectives to look for suspects, Bernie Fitzpatrick and John Shepard. They did look into a couple of leads, one a family friend, a neighborhood kid, and even Janet herself, of course, but nothing panned out. They had questioned Janet so many times in so many different ways that she started to rethink her first statement. At first, she was convinced she got home at 410 and she knew the exact time. She looked at the clock when she got home and she knew she had to call her husband's lawyer at 4.50. But after so much drilling from Fitzpatrick and Shepard, she started believing that maybe she didn't get home until 4.20 or even 4.35, but she was convinced that she was home at 4.10. Because Christine is considered to be a shy child, the police were convinced that she knew her abductor and after weeks of searching no clues were discovered according to the notes in the investigation. Someone that Christine did know was 25 year old Guy Paul Morin. Guy who lived next door was the second child to Alphonse and his wife. He had no criminal record only a couple of speeding tickets. He was a prodigy clarinet player who was in three jazz bands at the time. He was kind, respectful, he helped keep honeybees and made honey with his parents. He even gave some honey to Janet and Bob for gifts on occasion. He liked to work on cars with his dad who taught him how to weld. He did not drink and he did not smoke. And I repeat, he did not smoke. When detectives asked him about his interaction with Christine, he said he was 16 years older than her and talked to her maybe twice once about gardening tips and was when he helped her find her little dog Freckles. When it was asked why he did not help in the search for Christine when she first went missing, he told them it was because he was helping his dad install weeping tile around the foundation of his home. When asked about what he was doing at the time she was abducted and he said he had been working at a furniture manufacturing facility called Steels and Weston that was 57 kilometers south. He punched out at exactly 3.32 p.m. and would have been home by 4.14. But on that day, he had stopped for groceries and gas first, so he didn't get home until 5.30. When asked about what he thought about Christine, he, he had said, sweet and innocent, but sometimes they grew up to be corrupt. This stirred the police interest by that statement. They thought it was a little ominous, but he didn't mean anything by it, but he was labeled as quote unquote weird by the police. FBI were involved and they made a profile of the police believed the perpetrator was white, had high school, was somewhere between 19 and 26 years old. He had sloppy clothes. They believe he must have lived in Queensville because they were positive Christina knew the perpetrator. They believe that the person might have acne, a physical handicap, a history of arson or voyeurism, and a macho kind of nature. Guy's father of Fonz had seen the profile on TV and laughed at Guy and said, that sounds like you, but because of Guy's solid alibi, everybody thought it was funny at the time. Christine's body was put to rest in the cemetery behind her house where she used to play. Investigators honed in on Guy. They didn't look into any other suspects and swayed the evidence to point his way. 
A cigarette was found at the scene, and when it was discovered that Guy didn't smoke the cigarette, it disappeared. An officer at the scene had actually kept two notebooks, one with all the evidence, and one with just evidence that pointed towards Guy. Spoiler alert, that officer was charged with perjury and obstructing justice later on. A single dark hair found in Christine's necklace and semen was found on Christine's underwear. These items were sent to the Center of Forensic Sciences of Toronto, where they were analyzed by forensic scientist Stephanie Misnick. The police needed a hair from Guy to compare the hair they found at the scene of the crime. So one day an undercover police officer posed as a cosmetology student who was analyzing hair in class. She showed up at Guy's band practice one day and got a hair sample from him voluntarily. She was a friend of the band director's daughter. Stephanie Nisnik compared the hair found at the scene and Guy's hair. She said not only were they a match by the naked eye, they were also a match microscopically. With this information on the way to band practice, April 22nd, 1985, 14 police officers surrounded Guy and he was arrested. He was not sure how he was tied to the crime until he saw the undercover police officer at the station and recognized her as a cosmetology student and realized he had been framed. He was able to retain a lawyer, Clayton Ruby, and they held on tight to Guy's alibi, which he clocked out at 3.30 p.m. He didn't get home until 5.30 p.m. because he was getting groceries and gas, and the family all backed him up. The Crown psychologist who interviewed the Marins tried to tell the court that they were secretly lying about Guy coming home at 5.30. It was all a big conspiracy. It was discovered that hair analysis is only reliable to exclude someone as a suspect when hair is dark and when the hair is blonde. The, the hair then is an obvious no-brainer, no match. The hair in the necklace had been exposed to the elements for 90 days. It was severely degraded. It had been lightened by the sunlight. The bulb had decomposed and it was deemed uncomparable to anything. So it was a big mistake for the forensic scientist to say that it was not only a match by the naked eye and also not microscopically. The crown also gave evidence that there were red fibers that were found on the body and in Guy's car. But it actually came from the same forensic scientist who was wearing a red sweater during analyzing and not wearing a lab coat. And this was information that came from an anonymous source. Her boss did not inform anyone of her mishaps. Apparently, the Forensic Science Center of Toronto now is a much better center than it was in 1985. The Crown also planted an undercover cop named Gordon Hobbs in, in Guy Cell, who asked him what he thought his favorite movie was. Guy wanted to reply with The Shining by Stephen King, but at the time he couldn't remember the name of the movie. So he just said, you know, that movie with the scary kids and red rum, then he patted his heart and said it scared the crap out of him. What the undercover cop told the court is that he had said he wanted to red rum the innocent and stab them in the chest. That was a little off. His lawyer Clayton Ruby was a pretty fast talker and he was very good at what he did and Guy was acquitted. Even though Guy was acquitted, he went back home to a small town of Queensville, but everyone thought he was guilty. Media were constantly at his house. Nasty notes were in their mailbox. A beer bottle had been thrown through a window. And even though the acquittal seemed pretty solid, the Crown appealed in May 1990 due to a technicality based on instructions from the judge to the jury regarding reasonable doubt, and they went back to trial. And the second trial was actually even more flimsy than the first trial due to the poorly managed Forensic Science Center of Toronto 1985. This time, two of Christine's bones were missing. Stephanie Nisnik's work notes were missing. 100 to 200 hair and fiber slides were missing. And this time they presented a theory that Guy had lured her to his vehicle to show her his clarinet because she had just gotten her little recorder that day from music class. My personal theory is someone was in the house because someone put her jacket on the hook 
that was taller than her, and someone had the adult forethought to bring in the mail and the newspaper. Guy did take the stand at both of his trials to plead his innocence, and unfortunately, because he didn't look at the jury during his testimony, the jury thought that he was guilty, so they found him guilty. And at 32 years old, he was sentenced to life in prison. Guy was sent to the Kingston Penitentiary and he protested his innocence and said that he was going to appeal. Child killers and pedophiles are usually harshly treated in prison, but because the toughest guy in prison followed his case, he actually thought that he was innocent and told everybody to leave him alone, and everybody did. In 1993, he got with new lawyers and he filed an appeal and he was granted bail. In 1995, a new trial started and it was considered the most expensive illegal ordeal in Canadian history and it cost his parents half a million dollars in mortgage for his defense. This new thing called DNA testing came up and they decided to test the semen from Christine's underwear. His lawyers did not want them to test the DNA because they weren't sure what was going to come back. But the Crown wanted to, and so did Guy. He actually begged. The DNA testing went in, and the DNA testing came back. Not a match. The charges were dropped, and three days later, Guy was a free man. After 10 years of hell in the legal system, from 1985 to 1995, he was granted a public apology, $1.2 million in compensation, 500 of that went to his parents. He had a hard time finding employment after all of this, but he got himself into piano technology. He fine tunes pianos by ear. He bought himself a farm, he got married, he's got two boys, but the case still follows him and the kindergarten school at Thor College near Barrie asked his five-year-old to leave the school because they were no longer welcome be when they found out who he was. When the case was given to Toronto Police Superintendent Neil Tweedy and Detective Steve Hulkap, who were the heads of the Christine Jessup Task Force, they were given a three-year investigation from the Durham Police and the York Police that included 300 boxes of documents and a DNA sample. When they disbanded and the case went cold in 1998, they had collected themselves 325 DNA samples, mostly of sex offenders, connected to either the Christine Jessup abduction area or the area where her body was found. The sample of the DNA on Christine's underwear from the scene was compared to all these offenders and in the system, but nothing ever came up. In 2019, Detective Steve Smith from Toronto took over the cold case. He was 13 years old when Christine was found and he remembered the case and he decided to take a crack at it. He had taken a, a forensic genealogy course and he thought this would help crack the case and someone got a hold of him from a Texas-based genetic testing company called Othram and they asked him if he wanted to try out a case together and he chose Christine's. He was allowed one, one case and he thought about it and he discussed it with uh, his supervisors and he chose Christine's. And he did put some thought into it because he thought it would be precedent setting because forensic genealogy testing had not been proven in court in a case in Canada before. He sent in the DNA from Christine's underwear and they compared it to an ancestry platform called GED Match. And they got three hits. Very distant third cousins. And the family tree spread from those hits to the killer would have been 33,000 people. And that would have taken years to figure out. Detective Smith decided to try again. And they did decided to try a site called Family Tree. And they were able to get three more third cousins, but these ones were closer to the killer. They actually had a lucky hit that one of these was on the maternal side of the killer. 
And because of that, they were able to narrow down the match to 400 people. So Detective Smith knew a Toronto veteran police genealogist buff, and he had a couple of friends. And then the Texas based genealogy company called Othman offered to help with one of their genealogists. Together in eight months of work, they built a 400 person family tree using burial records, birth records, town registries, and social media. At the top of the tree, a gentleman named Henry Hoover Jr., born 1804 in Lennox, Ontario. From there, they populated the tree of 400 names of individuals, and they actually discovered the name of the great-great-grandson who killed Christine Jessup. The team was never told any names or anything about the investigation, they had zero clues, and they cracked the case. They actually narrowed it down to one person after the team linked a set of grandparents on either side of the killer. This person's name was Kelvin Dana Hoover. Kelvin Dana Hoover was born in 1956. He was from the Scarsborough area. As a kid, he spent a lot of time in the Sunderland area with his friend. He would do a lot of kayaking, hiking, camping. He liked to drink, party, gamble. He was known to be charismatic and he could be selfish. He had a vindictive streak that he showed to his friends when he was close to you. He had met Heather in the 1970s when she had moved from the Maritimes with her two sons. They got married and he adopted her sons and they had two more sons of their own. He did not have a criminal record and in 1984, when Calvin was 28 years old, they had a two-story suburban home in Oshawa. He suffered from an undiagnosed bipolar disorder, depression and anxiety, and he used alcohol and drugs to cope with that. In 1991, seven years after the murder, Calvin and Heather declared bankruptcy. Hoover started drinking more than usual around this time in 1996. Twelve years after the murder, they downsized to a low-rent housing in Ajax, Ontario. He had a DUI, and that's when Heather decided that she had had enough, and they divorced in 2003. He remarried a co-worker from Burlington named Joanne Roca. Uh, they were married in Las Vegas, but unfortunately she passed away in 2009. He was suffering with sleepless nights, anxiety, PTSD, tortured thoughts. He had depressive episodes and panic attacks. In 2014, he attempted suicide by his own vehicle, but he survived. In the summer of 2015, just outside of Port Hope, Calvin was living with one of his sons and he was feeling sad and anxious and isolated. His son went away for the evening to a wedding and with a bottle of red wine, Calvin sealed himself with a bunch of tape in the garage. He put on his headphones. He downed his bottle of tranquilizers called Clonanzapam. He turned on the generator in the garage and passed away. His son found his body in the garage and on his bathroom mirror was a post-it note that read, I hope you all have a good life. On October 1st, 1984, Janet was over at Heather's place and police assume Calvin overheard Janet tell Heather that she and Kenny were going to visit Bob in jail and Christine would be alone in the house for a bit after school until they came home. Although the span of time was only between her getting off the bus to when Janet and Kenny came home, he was still able to abduct her somewhere between 3.45 and 4.10 on October 3rd, 1984. It will never be known if she went with him because she knew him or if it was by force. She was 40 pounds and very tiny. It is assumed 
He took her to the Sunderland area because he knew that area and he knew he could be alone within dense forest off of a back road and he can be in and he would not be interrupted and he would not be seen by passerbys. Calvin's friend that lived nearby that he grew up with was never connected to the murder. Calvin was never interviewed by the police. He helped in the group search. He showed up at the funeral. He was at the wake and he gave his condolences to the family. He did not call any attention to himself even though he was diagnosed bipolar in 2010. Police were at the wake and the funeral and they were scanning the crowds and taking pictures. Calvin had no criminal history and he did not come up on their radar. After 36 years of this murder being unsolved, they finally had a name to the murderer. Detective Smith went about the task of connecting him to the murder. After discovering that Calvin was deceased, he got a hold of the coroner's office who performed an autopsy on Calvin's body. He was hoping he might have held on to some evidence from the autopsy or he would have to get his body exhumed for a DNA match. Just so happens the coroner had two vials of blood and in September 2020 he sent the virus of blood over to Detective Smith and Smith was able to get permission from a judge to have the blood tested for genetic. Forensic scientist named Kelly Bowie at the Toronto Forensic Science Centre did the DNA test and they were able to confirm that Calvin was indeed the match to the DNA that was found in Christine's underwear. On October 15th, 2020, Calvin Dana Hoover's name was announced as the killer of Christine Jessup. Detective Smith delivered the news to Guy, Heather, Janet, Bob and Kenny. He had a slight nervous reaction to the police being on his doorstep for another time for this case and when they told him the name of Calvin Hoover he had never heard of him. Heather who was 60 at the time was shocked and was reported saying that he watched her go to Christine's grave for 10 years and he never said a word. Janet barely remembers him and her and Bob divorced. They sold their house and they went their separate ways. She ended up in an apartment in Keswick north of Queensville and she does volunteer work. Robert was remarried and works in Sutton and is thankful his torture is over. Kenneth does construction work, works in Kenswick, and he is separated from his wife, but he has a nine-year-old daughter. The one address where the Hoovers were living at the time of the murder was in Christine Joseph's file database that Detective Smith found. He started looking up all of his other addresses because he think he might have done this before. He's looking at the addresses that he has lived in over the years. His job Working as an installer gave him moments away from home whenever he wanted to. He also did training courses in Dallas, Washington, and Chicago. Police are looking into those areas. His DNA has put, been put into the system and is continually being matched to cases in the UK and the US, but nothing so far. There is one little girl that went missing in 1985, July 30th. She has never been located. She was eight years old at the time. If you have any information on her whereabouts please contact your police thank you so much for joining me on canadian coffeehouse crime my name is Catherine, and i'll see you in the next case we were also a match microscopically 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 microscopic micros microscopically we are also matched microscopically. Microscopically. They were also matched microscopically. They were also matched microscopically. With this information on the way to ban practice, April 22nd, 1985,